God to prepare our hearts and minds to hear your word, sweep away our busyness, our distractions, and our wandering thoughts, so that we may sense the Spirit's movement and discern the teachings of Christ our Savior. Amen. Chapter 17 through 27 of the book of Leviticus is called the Holiness Code. These chapters, more than any others in the book, emphasize the holiness of God, the fact that God's people are also called to be holy. After a prologue, chapter 18 through 20 deals with holiness in the family, especially in its sexual activity. But one of the purposes of Leviticus was to teach God's people how to worship God. True worship can be best expressed by joining with the visible forms of the religious life with the holiness of the worshiper's life. Over and over again, Leviticus admonishes the reader, you must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees. Listen to the word of our God. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. You shall not follow their statutes. My ordinances you shall observe, and my statutes shall, you shall keep. Follow them. I am the Lord your God. You shall, not keep, you shall keep my statutes and my ordinances. By doing one shall live, I am the Lord. None of you shall approach anyone nearer of kin to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. Then we have a long list of kinship, kinship sexual prohibitions, and we will pick up our reading in verse 21. You shall not give any of your offspring to sacrifice them to Moloch and or profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not lie with male as a woman. It is an abomination. You shall not have sexual relations with any animal and defile yourself with it. You shall not have sexual relations, and nor shall any woman give herself to an animal to have sexual relations with it is perversion. Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways, for by all these practices the nations I am casting out shall you have defiled yourselves. Thus the land became defiled, and I punished it for its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you shall keep my statutes and my ordinance, and commit none of these abominations either the citizen nor the alien who resides among you. For the inhabitants of the land who were before you committed all these abominations, and the land became defiled. Otherwise, the land will vomit you out for defiling it, as it vomited out the nation that was before you. For whoever commits any of these abominations shall be cut off from their people. So keep my charge not to commit any of these abominations that were done before you, and not to defile yourselves by them. I am the Lord your God. This morning's reading from the first uh, from Romans follows Paul's statement of faith, which is, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of for salvation of everyone who believes. Then in our reading, he makes the case against us Gentiles for not glorifying God as a result of God's revelation in creation. Let us read from Romans chapter 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible as they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. So they are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. 
And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being or birds or four-footed animals or reptiles. Therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural, and in the same way also the men giving up natural intercourse with women were consumed with a passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons a due penalty for their error. And since they did not <clears throat> did not see fit to acknowledge God, gave them, God gave them up to a debased mind and to things that should not be done. They were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness. They are gossips. Slanderers of slanders, God haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious toward parents, foolish, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. They know God, God's decree, that those who practice such things deserve to die. Yet they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. Our reading from 1 Corinthians comes after Paul makes it clear it is no business of his to judge those outside the church, that that is up to God. Then he speaks about life as it is lived within the Corinthian church and how it should be lived in the Corinthian church. We read from chapter 6. When any of you has a grievance against another, do you dare take it to a court before the unrighteous instead of taking it before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels to say nothing of ordinary matters? If you have ordinary cases then, do you appoint as judges those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to decide between one believer and another? But a believer goes to court against a believer and before unbelievers at that. In fact, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud, and believers at that. Do you not know that evil wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, I <clears throat> Idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, sodomites, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revelers, robbers, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And this is what you used to be, but you were washed and you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. And then we come to our gospel reading this morning. I selected this morning's gospel reading to underscore the message that we may not reject any scriptures, but that all scripture is open to reinterpretation by the Spirit of God. And I've never read any interpretation more difficult for me personally than Jesus' interpretations of the scriptures. Let us begin with Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of these of one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> You have heard it said, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder. And whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. 
So when you are offering your gift to the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and sister, and then come and offer your gift. This is a word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's kind of hard to say thanks be to God to some of those some of those scriptures, and then difficult text. But have I told you recently how much I love our scriptures? I do. I admit that I am ignorant of the religious writings of other faiths in the world. But I cannot imagine that they are as robust as the scriptures we inherited from the Jews, or as intellectually challenging as the Gospels, and as diverse as the letters of the New Testament. I love them. I truly love them. And I enjoy nothing more than wrestling with them. There is nothing more fun than wrestling with the tensions within Scripture, knowing that wrestling with God's holy word may leave me lame like Jacob, but also confident that it will always leave me blessed like Jacob. You know what story I'm referring to, don't you? A story of Jacob when he was about to face the brother that he had cheated out of God's blessing all these years had passed. Jacob was so, was, was so extremely wealthy, was, was very extremely wealthy, but as he approached his brother, he was in deathly fear. He feared having to face his brother to such a degree that as he approached his brother from a distance, he continued to send people ahead of him with gifts for his brother, hoping to get his brother on his good side. And just before he was going to have to face his brother, he comes to the ford of Jabbok, and he sends his family across the river with the rest of all that he owns, all that he possesses, and sets them on the other side of the Jabbok between he and his brother. And he goes back across and spends the night on the other side with everything, his family, and everything he owns, and in the Jabbok between him and the brother he felt he fears. And then he falls asleep. And during the night, according to the story, a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man said he did not prevail, he struck Jacob. When the man saw that he did not prevail, he struck Jacob on the hip socket and crippled him. But Jacob hung on, saying, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, meaning heel grabber, which is what he did. You shall be called Israel, meaning blessed him, saying, You have striven with God and prevailed. And Jacob named the place Penel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. When we wrestle with the Scripture in communion with the Holy Spirit, I believe it is then that we see God face to face. So I really don't like that bumper sticker that says, The Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. I don't like it, because up until the conversion of the Apostle Paul, probably around 28 AD, the understanding of what the Bible said was that Don Stribling and people like me were excluded from the promises of God unless they would become something they weren't. According to the Bible, Gentiles like us had no place in the kingdom of God. That is, until a man named Saul, who was a persecutor of the way, a very small minority branch of thinking within Judaism, began wrestling with the scriptures in response to an encounter of the Spirit of Christ. So I'm glad that what the Bible was understood to say before 28 AD did not, in fact, settle it. But wrestling with the scriptures over our inclusion into the promises of God in Christ Jesus did not settle everything either. Because the Bible is the living Word of God. So wrestling with the Scriptures is an ongoing matter. We wrestle with the commands of Jesus and reinterpret them. Mark reports Jesus saying, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Yet 1,500 years later, Scottish Presbyterians made second marriage acceptable in the Scots Confession and condemned, actually condemned those who did not believe people should be allowed to marry after divorce. We wrestled with the Hebrew Scriptures 
and New Testament writings that fully accepted the practice of owning another human being as a possession. It wasn't until 1,600 years later when the Quakers began proclaiming slavery as unchristian, and later after the first great awakening in the 13 colonies back in 1730s and the 40s, that abolition became a minority tenet within the Christian interpretation of Scripture. In our nation, over 100 years after the first great awakening, the ongoing debate over the practice of owning another human being, as was allowed in the Bible, turned into a bloody war in which more than half a million people were killed. And we wrestled with the role of women in the church since the second century theologians began to teach that Paul excluded them from leadership, even though Huldah, the prophetess, way back in the beginning was the very first person to declare a written document the word of the Lord back in the period of the Second Temple. But what amazes me are what results from wrestling with the Bible. You see, what was once a minority branch in Judaism now claims the highest number of adherents in the world, the Christian church. I and a number of pastors I know and a lot of members of churches I serve have been a blessing to the church even though we are second married. And according to the Pew Research, the descendants of slaves in the United States are markedly more religious than whites, including a level of affiliation with religion at 87%. 87% of African Americans affiliate with Christianity. Weekly attendance at religious services, 59% of African Americans are in worship on a weekly basis. Frequency of prayer and religion's importance in their lives. And we all know that women make up the majority of people in attendance at almost all Christian churches in the United States. Now the church is faced with wrestling with the scriptures again. Some of our brothers and sisters proclaim a revelation from God that our family members and our friends who have a same-sex orientation should be free in Christ to live in a covenant-keeping relationship of mutual self-giving that reflects God's love for us. Historically, our understanding of the Bible hasn't allowed for that. Six passages in the Bible have been interpreted to exclude what a, a few minority branches within the body of Christ have begun to affirm. We read three of those six this morning. Since we Presbyterians declare and maintain a high authority of Scripture, we cannot cast out these texts, as Thomas Jefferson tossed out passages in the Gospels that revealed Jesus to be divine. Nor can we ignore the passages as if they didn't exist. We must admit that we all know passages in the scriptures that we pretend do not exist. Passages with which we do not wish to wrestle. I do not wish to wrestle with the text about being willing to risk my life for the gospel. Being willing to stake my, my livelihood and everything that I am on the life of the gospel. A large number of single Christians do not wish to wrestle with Paul's admonition in our reading to keep from fornication, to refrain from sexual intimacy outside of marriage. A great many American Christians do not wish to wrestle with the text where Jesus tells his disciples, do not resist an evildoer. All of us know passages in the Bible we wish we could pretend do not exist, but they do. And wrestle with them we must, if we are to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, and if we are going to be able to hold up the Bible as God's living word to us. And because we are faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, and because we do lift up the Bible, all of it, as God's living word to us, we wrestle with the Bible, and we must wrestle with the passages which we read this morning. I have wrestled with them. I have wrestled with them since I learned a friend of mine was gay. Though there was nothing about his self-knowledge, he would equate with being gay. The meaning of the term being light-hearted or carefree. It was only after he had contracted AIDS that he shared with me in a very silent, 
car ride back in the middle of the night back to his house in as indirect way as he could that he was homosexual. From the time he was a little boy in church, people had told him, you should become a pastor. He was a leader in his Methodist youth group. In college, he was the spark that kept the United Campus Ministry together at West Texas State University in my hometown. I met him at the Texas production. It's pretty much like the Muni in St. Louis, but in Texas, the largest outdoor canyon. After graduating from college, he studied for the ministry. Before he was ordained a deacon and was given his first church, he came out to his district superintendent and began efforts to change. He took the holiness code seriously, and he felt it meant his sexual orientation was a sin. He took Paul's writings that we read this morning as an exhortation aimed directly at him and in an effort to be faithful to Christ and uphold the teachings of the church and the scriptures. He did everything that was possible at the time to keep from acting upon his desire to have someone to hold him as his father held his mother. The Bible teaches that celibacy is a gift from God. John Calvin, founder of the Presbyterian branch of the body of Christ, said the demand for someone to be celibate who did not have a gift was to condemn that person to sin. Paul said that if a person could not control their passion, it would be better for them to marry, but that was not an option for my friend. He left the ministry because he was too committed to Christ and his church to remain a pastor while knowing his very being was at odds with the teaching of the church he loved. He even left the church and for a long time he cut himself off from those who loved him because he did not know how to share who he was with us, who he really was, because he could barely, if in fact he ever did, come to accept himself as who he was. He died. His beloved district superintendent, who always loved him, accepted him, counseled him, and tried as he might to help him to read the scriptures differently, conducted his funeral. And as you can tell, it breaks my heart to this day. But I've wrestled with this morning's text ever since. I, of course, began like everybody else to simply deny him. I pretended they didn't exist. And I was able to do that until a theological professor from the Butte Presbyterian Seminary named Mark Ackmeyer published an article supporting efforts in our church to keep openly gay and lesbian people from being ordained to the office of elder in the church. Those efforts resulted in a constitutional ban on gay ordination in our denomination back in 1997. I continued to ignore the passages as best I could because I seldom came in contact with open homosexuals in the church. But then I moved to La Mesa, and God decided to press the issue by making me aware after several years that my organist was homosexual, and about a third of the people that God brought through the doors of our church were homosexual. Fortunately, in an evangelical pastor of theology from the conservative Fuller Seminary, Jack Rogers wrote a book called Reading the Bible and the Confessions of Presbyterian Women. I like the book. And it supported my growing sense that the church's interpretation of the morning's passages as it relates to what we know as same-sex orientation was incorrect. But my take on the book was that it was strong on advocacy, but weak on exegesis. Kind of the way many of you probably feel about my sermon right now. The term exegesis comes from the Greek word exegetia, meaning out of, to guide, or lead. The English definition is critical interpretation that comes out of the text. By the action of passing Amendment 14F, which changes our denomination's directory for worship to read marriage, is a gift God has given to all humankind for the well-being of the entire family. Marriage involves a unique commitment between two people, traditionally a man and a woman, to love and support each other for the rest of their lives. The sacrificial love that unites the couple and sustains them as faithful and responsible members of the church and the wider community. In civil law, marriage is a contract that recognizes the rights and obligations of the married couple and society. In the Reformed tradition, marriage is also a covenant in which God is a, has an active part. 
in which the community of faith publicly witnesses and acknowledges. Therefore, none of us can ignore this morning's passages any longer. We must wrestle with the six passages and we must do a thorough exegesis of them. And wrestling is not dancing. We wrestle with an opponent. We dance with a partner. Most Bible studies are done in dances. People of like mind gather together and reinforce what they already believe. True Bible studies should be like wrestling matches, where we engage views that are different from our own. But Bible studies must also delve into the anthropology and sociology of the times to understand the original intent of a passage. We must understand the culture that produced the passage. Mark Ackermeyer, you remember? The Presbyterian theologian who provided the theological support for excluding LGBT members of the church from being ordained did just that. He wrestled with the text. And almost 20 years later, after supporting that ban and essentially being the theological purpose behind that ban, he wrote a, book, a new book, The Bible's Yes to Same-Sex Marriage, to share the results of his wrestling. But for me, Matthew Vines, a very traditional Presbyterian from Kansas, with a very traditional Presbyterian take on the Bible as the infallible rule of God, the Word of God has written the best exegesis on these passages while addressing the very real concerns of those who disagree with him in his new book, God and the Gay Christian. My wrestling with these texts has led me to believe that the Bible does not address what we know as same-sex orientation. What is denounced or condemned in the text we associate with homosexual behavior in the Leviticus passage are aimed at reinforcing boundaries between Gentiles and Hebrews and reflect the negative view of women held in the culture at the time. The message of Paul in Romans 1-3 through 3 is that no one is righteous. All people have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In our passage, we Gentiles exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than our creator. It is for that reason that God gave us over to the lusts of our hearts. I believe it is denounced in the Roman, what is denounced in the Romans passage is out of control sexual expression. We all know that. We all know about out of control sexual expression. We see it in our media all the time. The most common forms of same-sex behavior in the Greco-Roman world at Paul's times were pedastry, which essentially is a man with a student, a child, prostitution, and sex between masters and their slaves. <clears throat> Nowhere does Paul condemn two people who desire to be in covenant, life-giving relationship with people or with a person of the same sex. And what the Greco-Roman world condemned as unusual sexual expression for women, friends, I don't think had anything to do with same-sex behavior, but in, in actuality had uh, condemned any assertive sexual desire on the part of women. You need to know your place. That is the priority of men, not women. That's the understanding of the world at the time. And any sexual act by a man that would place him in a position of weakness was condemned as Paul does in our reading for Corinthians. In changing the definition of marriage to allow for the marriage of same-gender couples who covenant to love and support each other for the rest of their lives with a sacrificial love that reflects the self-sacrifice of Christ for his church, I do not think that we have revised any Bible passages. But in the one words of one person quoted in Matthew Vines' book, we have revisited the Bible and come to a more accurate understanding of it. I realize that most people disagree with where I have come out on this. I may be wrong. But what I know is this. The Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. At one time we have excluded you and me from the promises of the kingdom. So out of gratitude to Paul's willingness to wrestle with the scriptures, not only to wrestle with the scriptures, but to suffer for his interpretation of them, so that we might be understood to be beneficiaries of the blessings of God in Jesus Christ. Out of gratitude to Paul's willingness, we owe it to anyone 
who is seeking the promises of the kingdom through Jesus Christ to wrestle with the Bible, to see if the Holy Spirit that revealed the mystery of our inheritance in Christ will reveal a mystery not made known to humankind in former generations, even if it leaves the church walking with a limp until Christ comes. To the glory of God and to the joy of all God's children. Amen.